friends. Welcome back to the Global Voices interview series. I'm Valerie Hickey from the World Bank, coming to you live from the bank's spring meetings. This is a time of the year, beautiful spring weekend here in Washington, D.C., where thousands of people have come together, including hundreds of the world's top leaders on issues ranging from development, poverty alleviation, human capital to climate change. I'm delighted to say that this afternoon we get one of those leaders with us, Rachel Kite. Thank you, Val. She's the UN Secretary General's Special Representative on Sustainable Energy, the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. Rachel, you and I just came from a meeting, yeah. a coalition for climate action, where dozens of ministers of finance, not ministers of environment, ministers of finance, sat around the table and declared their intent to do something about climate change. Minister of Colombia, Minister of Finance from Colombia said, couldn't have happened 10 years ago. Couldn't, certainly, they would have laughed at the idea 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you were one of the lone voices in the wilderness making a clarion call for why climate change wasn't about the environment, it was about development. Yeah. How did we get from there to here? How did you do it? Well, uh, well, the World Bank had a very important role in it, so you did it too. But I, I think what was special about today was um, that there have been there have been meetings in the past where I remember in 2007, Sri Mulyan Indrawati and Bob Zalik, who was then the president of the bank, got ministers together in Bali at a, at a, at a climate meeting, I think, and briefed them on economic issues related to climate change. And it, we, it was a PowerPoint, and it, it was sort of a bit wonky, and you know, ministers sent their senior officials, and some of them came. And, and then, you know, over the years, the meeting, there's been smaller meetings here with finance ministers, but really sort of briefing them about why they need to think about this. What happened today is a coalition of ministers sort of self-forming have sort of said, look, this is our issue and we've got to take it forward. I think two things. One is... Um, uh, this is actually about how we structure the economy. This is about what we value, what we don't. We have to put prices on the pollution we don't want, and we have to uh, provide public finance to support you know, a resistance towards extreme weather events. We have to invest in the agriculture that can be resistant to heat and drought because of climate change impacts. And so this is starting to become a whole economy issue, and that's understood by ministers of finance. Who else needs to be at the table? I know you do a lot of work with central bank governors, for example. Are they interested in this? Do they see a value to talking about climate change? Yeah, I, that's a very good point. In the last two years, uh, there's been a, a, a really uh, important network of central bank governors that has grown up, led by the Banque de France, the Bank of England, uh, the Dutch central bank, um, with central banks from all over the world. And what they're doing as central bank governors is looking at the risk to the economy uh, from climate change and really trying to get their hands around that and then working out as central banks what kind of guidance they should be giving to companies, what guidance should they be giving to the government and what kind of oversight and regulation is going to have to happen. So we've also seen big moves on transparency. Trans um, there are now guidelines on how companies should be talking about how are they going to make their profit in the future in a world where climate change is you know, impacting uh, their business and their future business. So little by little, all of the instruments of the economy are beginning to understand how this is going to impact daily lives, livelihoods, jobs, uh, incomes of companies, business of companies, the physical assets of companies. But, you know, it's still a little too little, still a little too late. We're going to have to pick up speed. So I know one of the things we worry a lot about is obviously the Paris Agreement 2015 a huge milestone in the fight against climate, climate change. But the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, the plans countries put forward against the, the Paris Agreement, they'll get us to 3.4 yeah. degrees change. That's the end of the world. That's extinction, as David Attenborough said two days ago. How do we bend that arc of economic growth towards sustainability in a serious way? How do we get below 1.5 degrees change? So, um I think this is a real moment of um, where we require far-sighted political leadership. Um, I, you know, and it's a little worrying because you know there are parts of the world where we don't have it. Uh, but you see in the business community. Uh, business leaders who can see around the corners because they can see that technology can solve a lot of this. They can see that we actually have lots of cash in this sort of global economy. It's just being mis misused or used for the wrong things, you know, misallocated. 
And then, so I think there's a business community that is like, we better get going, we better get going now because our businesses are not going to survive these kinds of changes. And then I think what's really important is what's happening on the streets every Friday. So last Friday, yesterday, students all over the world, right. you know, across every town and city in the UK where I come from, you know, high school kids, middle school kids out in the street saying this is not urgent, it's actually an emergency. On Monday, the Extinction Rebellion will um, go into its next phase uh, in the UK and around the world. And there's an, uh, this sort of, there is something coming together between people on the street saying, tell us the truth, the truth will set us free. And we, government and the people, can respond to this emergency. Emergency. And business is saying, you know, if we could have some far-sighted government leadership saying this is what we need to do, we need to change our agricultural system, we need to change the energy system, we need to change the basis of taxation, you know, we can be part of that and it's going to have to be a coming together. It's a, it's a time where every government needs to be a government of national unity. But it's a far-sighted, we need far-sighted vision but it's a near-term problem. Yeah. Climate change isn't something that's going to happen in a hundred years. This isn't just something that our kids and our grandkids are worried will happen to them when they're adults. This is something that's happening today. So how do we make sure we don't spend too much time talking about the future of yeah. economic growth and really talk about action today? Well, so yesterday, three, three, I saw three separate news stories. One is that the World Bank Group put out a, an estimate of the damage done by this extraordinary storm that hit this, yeah. the coast awful, of Mozambique, awful. obliterated Beira, and has knocked on, has knock on effects in three or four countries, right? And there's an extraordinary number in the billions and billions and billions and billions. I also saw a little video clip by Penny Morden, the Secretary of Development, uh, International Development in the UK, thanking the British people for their response to the emergency uh, appeal for cash to help the victims of that. And, you know, the British people are very um, um, generous and had come Always up with, you know, been. tens of millions of pounds. And then I saw the number from the UN in a separate news story saying that they um, need to mobilise $250 million worth of development and humanitarian assistance. Yeah, humanitarian assistance. So we have humanitarian assistance in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, which we have to mobilise every time one of these storms happen. And then we have costs, which are now being estimated to go into the billions of billions. Now, that storm is not a unique storm. That's going to happen again and again and again. And so the quicker we start calibrating our economies to, uh, A, cope with those storms to the extent that we can, but then do the things that will mean that, you know, over the next decades, that becomes uh, something that is manageable or less likely to happen. This is this is, yeah, you know, this is a um, being penny poor and pound foolish, right? right? Um, now it's the conversation we're having in places like the Caribbean, for example, where, where, where you were getting right? hit by hurricanes again and again. They're not talking about hurricanes as natural disasters anymore. They're talking about them as the weather. Yeah. It's just the weather. This is now going to happen every few years, if not every year. How do you take a whole of government approach? How do we make sure, particularly small island developing states, small states, and the very poor, who are always the people at the end of the day who get trapped by our failure to act? Yeah. So How do we make sure to keep them at the center of this? So their vulnerability, you know, organizations like the Bank Group and others for, for the longest time understood their vulnerability to be their income poverty. Right, and that, that is not the way that you understand that anymore. Their vulnerability is that, you know, they may some of them may be poor in income terms, but you know they they are vulnerable because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now that the climate has changed the weather patterns. Right. And so we have to change the way that we can use financing to support them. But we also have to then make sure that their infrastructure is resilient. So we know that we can build uh, resilient, um, uh, distributed and decentralized energy systems that you can flip down and flip back up again in a storm. They might cost a little bit more upfront, but frankly, they will save you so much money over time. Absolutely. So we've just got to completely change the way we think. So we've got to terrace every one of those hillsides so that next time the storm comes, there isn't a Landslide. We've got to plant different seeds because they will be able to tolerate to the conditions. And if that costs more now, we should spend that money now. Because if in 20 years' time we turn around and we've got all this nicely stewarded development finance right. and all this nicely stewarded climate finance, but we didn't spend it on the things that would make people more resilient now, what was the point? Right. It's an investment. It's about yeah. investing. In people. But obviously energy is at the center of both this debate and a lot of what you're doing yeah. today. We hear sometimes from people, particularly extremely poor people, 
that they worry that they're going to be lost in the race towards sustainable energy. The 600 million people, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa today who do not have access to electricity worry that as we try and change the electricity systems, move away from fossil fuels yep. in our hurry, and rightly so, to stop climate change, that means they have to wait longer to get electricity. Their kids can't do homework at night. What do you say to that? How do you reconcile those two absolutely urgent needs? Um, because I think we can actually walk right through the middle of the problem because the people, the 600 million um, sub-Saharan Africans who don't have access to energy today are not going to get it um, uh, through putting more fossil fuels into centralised grids. Those grids haven't reached them up to now. They're not going to reach them anytime soon because the economy, the economic model of centralised fossil fuel power into a grid which loses 30 to 40 to 50 percent of its energy through transmission losses goes as far as it goes, takes care of the people in the main cities because that's where your voter base is and then doesn't reach everybody else. That model needs to be um, made more efficient, needs to be made cleaner, needs you can densify the grid, so fill in the people in the grid who don't have that, that we can do. But the people who live beyond the power lines and some of the people living underneath the power lines were never going to be reached that way. The good news is that uh, new technology, um, cheaper renewables, cheaper storage, means that we can actually put decentralized clean energy into um, secondary cities and villages. We can we, we don't have to go to households, we can go through making sure that health systems are electrified, so your clinics work. We can make sure that agricultural extension services are electrified, so you've got drop per crop solar irrigation. We can make sure that the electricity, decentralised, renewable, follows the productive path of the economy. And the countries that are doing that, setting the policy table for that, are closing the energy access gap really quickly. Bangladesh, Kenya, places like Togo now. Um, um, you know, the countries that are still sort of in a model of how we used to do it, right. that's going more slowly. So there are 21st century solutions to these problems. Technology is up to the job? But yeah, I, I mean, I think the good news is that the technology is affordable and it can be distributed in a way that people can benefit from it. What's got to happen is that the policy, the policy has to catch up. Uh, ministers have to be confident that we can build something that looks different from what we had before and get better results. But the evidence is beginning to come in that if you do do that, then, then you, you get the results you want. So we can grow, we can get social justice, we can get human capital and we can stop climate change. Yeah, you can, you can, you can square the circle. It isn't that, OK, we've got a billion people without electricity, we have to build more coal-fired plant plants. Not, you know, we, can, uh, we can connect the people without electricity to decent enough services for their productive use in the economy. We can use new technology to do it. That new technology is not that expensive. And really Really for about $50 billion a year every year, we, we, could, we could fix this problem. And if you don't fix the problem of access to clean energy affordably and reliably, you're not going to get your healthcare outcomes, you're not going to get education outcomes, you won't get uh, food security outcomes. It's kind of uh, a golden thread of, it's the of enabler many other things. Yeah. so many other things. Yeah. So people don't go to the ballot box and say, I'm going to vote for energy. People go to the ballot box and say, I want healthcare, I want my kids to go to school, I want a job. But those things depend upon affordable, reliable energy. And it's clearly so important for women. Yeah, yeah. So you want to be safe on your way home from work, you know, yep. LED, solar, street lighting helps. You want to be able to have a micro business from home, so take some of the fruits that you're growing, turn them into pulp and put them in a little refrigerator and then sell the pulp and make juice. Yeah, you, and so this is how women start to, uh, to be able to take control of their own lives and when we get to the energy access solution sort of part of the economy, there are so many women entrepreneurs. Right. And, and women are actually shaping the debate about, you know, this is what we want, this is what we'll pay, this is how we want it. And, you know, many of them are saying, well, I'm going to have to build my own business to do it because that's not what the traditional energy companies are offering. So clearly you're hopeful. <laughs> you've seen this from you a period be, when right? you were the lone voice, now you have a whole group of people, you have broad shoulders that a lot of people are lifting you up on. What keeps you up at night, though? Are there places where we're not moving as fast as we need to? Yeah, I mean, what keeps me up at night is that meeting felt too comfortable. I mean, I, I really take my hat off to you and the rest of the World Bank team that got those ministers of finance in the room together talking about this issue, but it felt way too comfortable. And on Monday, there are going to be kids 
and young people and middle-aged women and, and you know all kinds of just like lumpy bumpy ordinary people you know stopping the traffic in Oxford Street and lying down on Westminster Bridge because it's urgent right. and um, what makes me worry is that that meeting was a little too comfortable. And you know it's something we always worry about that you can't do climate change by events. Yeah. This isn't about going from one meeting to another. We often get accused not just the World Bank but the community working on this issue that we just go to events. We talk to the same people. We're often talking to the choir. And now it's so amazing to see that everybody isn't waiting for us yeah. and our events. They're actually moving forward. Yeah, and what we need to do in response is, is be honest with each other. Because, yes. you know, you get caught up in the sort of like, you know, the sort of diplomatic language of, you know, everybody has to be thanked and all the rest of it. But we have to sit down and look at each other in the eye and say, OK, you know, what are we going to do? And, f you know, if, you know, we, there isn't an insurance product that's going to solve the problem of a country which, you know, stands to lose 70% right. of its assets right. the next storm that comes right. along that's going to be paid for by the public purse of the government right. and how are they going to survive we have to have those honest conversations and if they don't happen here they won't happen and the good thing is that you know we've got great female leadership here we've got great sure, female absolutely leadership. so I mean there's enough people who know um, uh, and I think that you know I'm inspired by young people and if you know if we can't get it right then we should walk off the stage and let young people take the I couldn't agree with you. Over. It's <laughs> nice to know there are people standing behind us ready to push us out of the yeah, way I'm ready if we're not moving push. fast yeah. enough. Push me. There you go. No, please don't because I know <laughs> one of the things we worry about is you you have just been asked to take over as Dean of the Fletcher School of International Affairs at Tufts University. Yeah, very humble. You're the first woman to do it. In fact, you're the first woman to ever be a Dean of a School of International Affairs. So you're clearly taking this issue of youth leadership and really raising the next generation of leaders very carefully. What would be the first thing you'd say to them? When you step towards them on that first day of your new job, what are you going to tell them? That, first of all, they're in the right place. <laughs> I think Fletcher is a, a remarkable school, um, but that um, this is a volatile world. It's a complicated world. Um, it is uh, moving quickly and shifting in different ways, and that um, we need a cadre of global leaders uh, from all walks of life. There is no, you know, there's no one path to leadership right. anymore. So through the private sector, through civil society, through business, large and small, we need a cadre of. Um, multifaceted, multi-talented leaders who are comfortable with amb ambiguity, comfortable making decisions where we don't know exactly everything that will be around the corner, but we have to make good bets. And in order to do that, you, um, you, yeah, you, you have to uh, understand the perspectives of all kinds of different people. There's no one percent that makes the decisions right. anymore. Right. So I'm Thankfully. looking to put into the field of play. Uh, a set of global leaders that are comfortable with change, comfortable with ambiguity, and comfortable making decisions in ambiguity. And multi multilingual between issues of science and issue of politics, because yeah. the two often end up crashing instead of building on each other and being complementary. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing this on the issue of migration, for example. We know that climate change is going to lead to migration patterns that are different today. There's, there's such discussions that are going on right now about this. And how do you think about that issue? How do you talk to those new leaders, those young leaders, about how to manage that issue that is so emotive for so many people, that has so much politics behind it, but also has so much economics and science behind it? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, uh, we're in a dangerous place in the mo at the moment where um, we can just discount science if it doesn't sit right with us. And so, um, again, building the skills for, for people to um, appre uh, yeah, appreciate the scientific method, appreciate and hold on to and hold dear the scientific method and what uh, fact is or what, you know, and then un but understand that everybody has different truths, but not getting those two things mixed up. I think that, that's really important. And, you know, leadership means you're going to have to have broad shoulders. It means you have to lean back and bring people with you. It means you have to listen and then you have to find a way to craft uh, a conversation that is respectful and you know, but at the end of the day we have to hold on to what is fact and what is uh, what, what is science I think that the um, the issue of migration has become this 
totemic issue of the other. And as people are frightened for their own future, then we know that sort of xenophobic um, knee-jerk reaction is easy to exploit. And so Europe is in trouble, this country's in trouble, uh, even within countries. So that the fact that I think there's some re remarkable statistic that you know, only 6% of African migrants actually go to Italy, Germany and France, right? But you know, the narrative of Southern Europe and Central right. Europe is that you know, we're being flooded by um, Africans. You know, most African migration is within one African country. Um, but of course, there's a relationship between climate and, and uh, migration. There's a relationship uh, between all kinds of economic pressures and migration. And I think, I, you know, I work at the moment for the Secretary General. For him, there are three defining issues at the moment. One is climate. One is the, the multilateral discussion right. and institutions that we have. And then the third is migration. For him, those are the three big issues. And it's true that so much of migration is not actually international. No. So much it's of it internal. is simply urbanization. It's, it's within countries or within smaller regions. And how do we begin to change that conversation? What tools do we bring to the discussion, particularly around urban planning, so that we can plan cities in a way that are climate smart, but they're also ready for the people who are coming in and for the people who are going to require access to basic services. They want to live in healthy cities. They want opportunities for their kids, but for themselves to live and to work and have lives of dignity. So it is a really good question. I work a lot with engineers that work on things like energy efficiency and energy productivity. You know, and they, they get frustrated because they've got all these solutions, right? But these solutions need to sort of then be... Uh, understood in very early stage, crowded in design of, right. well, how do we want to live? Um, how are we going to move around? Um, how do we help poor people get from their home to work and back cleanly and quickly? Um, and it's sort of a completely sort of, you know, ground up rethinking process. I think the good news is that, st that stuff is starting to now happen right. in planning schools and architectural schools and whatever. But when you, the, the, at the end of pipe where I am, you still see architects, realist, realtors, engineers, whatever, struggling to have a conversation early enough to shape a development. Right. The so incentives we, we already, are, are so often yeah. misaligned, aren't they? And the financing is actually the piece that drives it in the wrong direction. So, for example, we talk about the new build, right, for Africa and yep. Asia in particular. In Europe and, and North America, well, in Europe in particular, you've got this deep refurbishment of buildings that has to happen. I mean, like we're talking about really deep refurbishment. But, you know, when the owner of the building and the tenant of the building are different exactly. and the financing is like in the middle, building the financial mechanisms to make that easy to do every time a tenant turns over or whatever. You know, so these are things that we need these ministers to focus on okay. because the, the, it can be done. We, we have a lot of the materials, we have a lot of the technology, but it's not happening at speed or scale. So these are the frontier issues that you see the issues of finance, really trying to get the financial incentives right? Yeah, I think so finance is sort of like, you know, it's it's one of the vascular systems of the body, right? It goes everywhere. And if we can, if we can get that flowing in a different way, um, then I think we can start to make change. And it's not, and I'm not saying let's have more finance. There's plenty of money in right. the world. We're spending it on the wrong things. Right. It's it captured by just a few people, right? So it's, it's, mis, it's misallocated and misaligned. And so if we start to sort of unpick that, but what I'm learning is it's much easier to commit new money to a new thing than it is to repurpose yes. money that's already stuck in the system and not doing anything. So if, when it comes to cl clean energy for poor people in Africa, there are tens and tens and tens of project development facilities, finance facilities, Insurance funds or whatever. Facilities all with uh, European and OECD country taxpayers' money sitting in them, and they're not, the, the money's not flowing because there's too many it's rules, productive. it's difficult, it's fragmented. And so we don't need to go back and say we need more development finance or more climate finance. We like, we've got all of this money and it isn't flowing, so can we unpick it so it will flow? That's actually a harder conversation than let's set up a new facility. Right. And uh, that's a little shocking, but um, we're going to have to deal with that in the next 24 months, I think. Promise me that you'll stay part of that conversation and you'll keep pushing us 
even as you move to Tufts because while you're building the next generation, we still need you in this generation because you're one of the leaders, you're one of the people we look to, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, Rachel. Well, any chance to talk to you, Valerie. And by the way, we, more people, you should be like her, right? A forester, a science-based, <laughs> brilliant diplomat. We need more Valerie's. I paid her to say that. <laughs> Friends, thank you so much for joining us. Come back for more Global Voices interviews from here, Washington, D.C., the World Bank at our spring meetings. Thank you.